My name is Tanya Allen. I'm an assistant professor of art and design um, in the College of Design at NC State. And today, uh, my colleague and I, Sarah Queen, who's a professor of architecture, are First of all, we're probably going to give you whiplash with how different this presentation is going to be from the first one. This is a, not a, a hugely technical um, uh, conversation or class, but we were both really interested in how um, these tools, such as ArcMap and other data visualization tools, are being used by our designers um, in design research, and also how that can help uh, our students uh, engage in research, but then also sort of understand the, the argument that they're making with their research, especially as it relates to urban planning and the future of Raleigh. Um, so, actually, sorry, do you wanna introduce yourself or let me just keep going? Okay. Um, so we sort of started out, uh, I think both of us, but talking a lot about the role that history plays in urban development. So as designers uh, and in the college and design and architect and um, landscape architecture and planning, we're not often thinking about the role of history um, in contemporary development or sort of how we've gotten to where we are contemporarily, but then also where we are in the future. So that was a main goal of the course. Um, and obviously in a city like Raleigh where a lot of our students are going out to actively engage in future development of Raleigh, we thought it was um, a good opportunity to sort of integrate that topic. Um, and also as students are becoming more and more um, ex accessible or as data, um, both GIS data, but also other types of data set are being more accessible to students, they are actively using that in their research process. We also wanted to create a course where they were sort of actively interrogating the visualizations, how they were using that data, where that data was coming from, how they were manipulating it, how they were isolating certain points, uh, parts of it. So, um, oh, that looks much better. Um, so we devised the course uh, sort of in uh, three buckets or with three different projects where we were looking at different types of maps. So in the first project, looking at geospatial maps or mapping. Um, introducing students to a specific type of research, so in the first project, archival research, um, looking at very specific types of data sources, so in the first project, GIS data, and that's the one that we're gonna focus on today. But then moving them out of a geospatial realm into more relationships and networks to try to get to um, maybe influences or causal correlational relationships. And then actually in the last project, asking them to go out to the sites and the areas that they were looking at to see evidence of how the history has sort of contributed to the contemporary context and what they saw there and how people were using it. So, um, so that's sort of how it was structured. So today we're gonna focus in this uh, mostly on project one because that's where we were using um, uh, ArcMap. So um, these were sort of some of the the software that we were using, just again to give you a little bit more context, and these were some of the core readings that we did. So a lot of our students did not have a good background on research or design research, so actually introducing them to methodologies was really important. Um, this book by Isabella Morales is fairly new, a couple of years old, and is actually, I think, a, one of um, the most accessible sort of visualization um, books on mapping and other types of non-geospatial uh, visualization. They gives theory as well as sort of application, so it's this nice hybrid of the visual but then also theoretical background and cognitive and why we understand things the way that we do. And then we also wanted to sort of interrogate the power of the map as we were doing it. As these students were creating maps, we wanted them to sort of challenge their own assumptions about the truth of what it is that they were creating. So we sort of had these three texts that we were uh, looking at throughout. So actually I'll turn this over to Sarah to start talking about these. So the main project we're gonna really show you, we're gonna focus on is that first project, which was the nature of Raleigh's history. We divided the students into six groups so that they began looking at Raleigh in terms of the uh, um, history of the natural city, the social city, the political city, the economic city, so they could focus their <clears throat> deep dive into archival research. So they were both looking at, um, they were going to the local history museum, they were bringing up hand-drawn old maps, they were looking through UNC, um, at Chapel Hill, they have an awesome um, map database, Sanborn maps, and then they were trying to bring that those sources into GIS and plot points in addition to sort of shape files that they're finding from um, governmental sources mostly. And um, 
So to start with, this is Jessica Klink. She had the natural city. So her, um, uh, the data that she was looking at were forest lands, uh, greenways, uh, state parks, local parks. And what was really interesting in comparison to most of her classmates is the orientation devices that we usually use to understand the landscape that we navigate the landscape through, the roads, the landmarks, are removed from this map. And it's really only at the, um, the, the tightest scale up there on the upper left that you begin to see sort of the roads emerging with the bike lanes and the city parks. And so um, <clears throat> by asking each of the students to focus differently their topic, the maps oriented us to different systems, which um, might be obvious to think about, but to ask students to very purposefully isolate the data sets that they were using um, was really made them think about what part of the landscapes they chose. Um, we also dictated the format so we could easily compare the maps from each of the students because as you'll see soon, they quickly moved out of GIS and moved into post-editing software to um, calibrate the arguments within their maps. So we started at um, the historic Raleigh um, from north, south, east, west street, which was one to 6,000, I think. And then we had the contemporary um, Raleigh city scale, the county scale, and then the three county triangle region scale. Um, we also wanted the students to try to verbalize and synthesize what their maps were about. So um, the poster um, framework was dictated as well, where they had to do synthesizing text. And then a, um, a timeline that tried to orient the events and the places in time, not just in space with one another. Okay. Um, uh, so as Sarah mentioned, the students, whereas Jessica really spent a lot of her time in GIS and did a very, very little or uh, at least not uh, a huge amount of post-editing work in Illustrator, uh, James was looking at sort of crime in the city. And so in his upper left-hand map and his quad map at the old city scale, really the GIS data is, uh, and the shapefiles are sort of at the um, at the very base level. So he's looking at crime rates and you can't really see it, but there's these little plus signs there that are specific incident reports. But then he really quickly sort of took some of that data but moved out of GIS in order to be able to show more aggregated uh, topics in terms of um, uh, police force and the number of police that are relative to the size of the area or the size of the population or the crime indexes, so comparing certain ta cities and towns to, um, to the overall country averages. And he overlaid that on top of what were fairly simple exported shapefiles from GIS. So he used GIS really, um, or ArcMap, as a really basic sort of data crunching map creation tool um, with fairly simple information that then he aggregated and added a lot of additional information onto, as well as, in the larger map on the right, um, the districts uh, continuing, sort of bringing in case studies and archival image there um, to talk about what some of the um, public safety spaces are in, uh, in Raleigh and the Triangle. And similarly, um, Rebecca was looking at the sort of history of education as a social structure. Um, and how that has influenced uh, education today, but also where current city, uh, current, excuse me, schools are being placed as Raleigh continues to grow and uh, schools become at or over capacity more regularly. She was really interested in how integration, segregation, busing, a lot of those social issues have contributed to that. And what was interesting about her maps is a lot of the data on um, base school assignments were all in um, pre-exported uh, map files on the Wake County Public School System site. And so what she ended up doing, rather than overlaying all of that, she sort of, sort of took one case study example from downtown Raleigh of two neighboring neighborhoods and where those uh, students went to school. So it became much more of a narrative map right off the bat because the collecting of the data was really um, uh, not in a very user-friendly or reformatable form right away. 
Sarah Lauer also was looking at the social city, and she found this awesome map at our local history museum, which showed the original land grant owners from the colonial era um, of Wake County, before it was Wake County. And she um, scanned that in, uh, geolocated it in GIS, and then um, mapped where those landowners land, how they transferred that land over time, over their sort of family tree. So she had to go to public records, she had to look at family trees, she had to relate that to geospatial information, um, to deeds, to records like that. And um, she was really interested in tracing the power transfer through money and through land ownership in Raleigh. Um, she found as she moved into her maps that were not geospatial but more relational that she could actually tell the narrative better. So that you'll see later on in our presentation the maps that we got to next and how they complement uh, information that we can't see in a geospatial projection. And here Devin was really interested, so we taught this class last spring. There was um, the court case going through about our uh, redistricting cases and she, she got really interested in gerrymandering and how it happens and how it's happened over many decades uh, and what are the shifting boundaries, which uh, districts are stable and which districts are shifting over time and why. Um, so she, um, looking, if you zoom in at the city scale, those are fairly stable, but looking out as you zoom out to the triangle scale, which of those districts are not stable, which of those districts, depending on the census, depending on who is running the redistricting, how those are being redistricted and why. So sort of, um, again, for her, she was seeing the pattern here. One big thing for us in this class was to start not with um, an argument, but to let the map show us different patterns. And then through those patterns that were illuminated, try to figure out why. This is not indicating cause at all, it's just indicating what's happening. And then try to dig deeper into the research to figure out and to try to figure out what's correlational, what's causal, and to try to make an argument about that. So these are visual essays in a way. So to show how this then fit into the whole class, we want to walk through one student's series of maps, um, starting with her geospatial maps that relate to the, the, the maps that you've already seen, and then moving on to her relational maps, and then to her experiential maps. So Courtney Richardson, she was really interested, sorry these are blown out a little bit, she was really interested in the rail development and the relationship of how Raleigh, um, specifically, um, downtown Raleigh historically was um, linked to the development of the radio railroad and then how further out industrial development at different points in history have depended on the railroad. So what was really interesting looking at old historic maps here is that how the railroad network was much more robust historically than it is now. It came down into the legislators, um, their open plaza quad that has the parking deck underneath it. Um, the warehouse district had so many spur lines that came in, came in through buildings, and you can start to see why certain industrial buildings are, that are still remaining, the mill buildings that are still remaining in Raleigh, why they are where they are, even if that spur line is no longer there. She was also looking uh, more regionally about how, what towns developed along the railroad, railroads and what sort of era they had their boom in. Um, and if that was rail oriented, if that was oriented to something else. And looking at the contemporary spur lines, which all happen about 10 to 15 miles outside of Raleigh, where the sort of um, more um, industrial landscape, active industrial landscape is today. Um, and at the end of the... At the end of the first series of maps, one of the main outcomes um, after the geospatial maps was actually for them to write down a list of questions that that entire process sort of illuminated for them. And Sarah already mentioned this, but two of the main questions that came out for Courtney was really what was the relationship or what was the impact of these rail lines or these railway companies on the emergence or the growth of towns uh, in and around Raleigh and the Triangle. And so in the second set of maps where we're calling them maps, they're non-geospatial, we were intentional about having them take them out of the geospatial realm into a more relational map. She isolated and sort of aligned the history of certain railroads with the ebb and the flow of population growth in cor corresponding towns. And so in doing that, 
she was able to dive deeper, so that was part of the goal of this, is to dive deeper into sort of one topic, move away from the bird's eye and into, this is still a bird's eye in a sense, but, um, and just go deeper into one area. And one of the things that was interesting about this, I think, is, um, is in the charting and the graphing of the population growth, there was a lot of conversation, and this, there was a lot of conversation throughout the course of the, the class, about how some of the visual representations actually misrepresented pieces of information. And so what is interesting in the population growth in this is that really these populations, all of the, the sort of jagged lines that's going up like that, up and down, are still all positive growths. They're just 500% positive or 200% positive. So there's actually a lot of conversation about how that sort of misrepresented what the, the overall trend of what was going on in those particular areas. Um, and then if you want to go on to the next one. Well, oh, one, go ahead. one really quick interesting thing that I learned about the railroads is that um, each of these bars is an independent railroad company. And then it's a, right now we have two main railroad companies now that sort of occupy the space of the triangle. Um, but at one point there were tens of railroad companies and, and they only went from maybe at 50 miles. And so just the way that railroad companies were structured shifts their political power, shifts how they occupy the landscape. And so um, even though she was studying the economic city and the railroad specifically, she could not ignore the political structure that surrounded those. So that it, we asked them to look specifically, but then we, they all became inter intertangled by the end. <laughs> sure. Um, this one she used raw as her... Um, as her visualization tool instead of um, ArcMap. And here, the database that she was looking at were um, the Raleigh-Gaston Railroad, the people who um, held positions on the board of the Raleigh-Gaston Railroad. And so their names are down the middle. So those are all the people. And the height of their line says how long they were occupying their position. And then the, the um, column on the left are the positions that they held outside of the railroad. Many of them were planters. Um, some of them were bankers. Some of them were lawyers. And so which, which sort of segments of the population these men were coming from that were running the railroad. And on the right, the positions that they served within the railroad. So she was here zooming into the structure of the, of the company that she was looking at the physical manifestation of the, the city before. And then finally, as Tanya said earlier, what we asked them to do at the end was to go out to these locations in the city and what do they perceive about them. So they've studied a lot about this as a network. They've studied a lot about, she studied the sort of institution of the railroad. But now as she navigates this space through downtown Raleigh, what does she perceive about it? And she really found it to be an informal space used by a lot of people that we often, used by a lot of uses other than the railroad that are not documented, more informal uses, um, and that it was a space that at one point was the lifeline of the city, but now is divorced from its context. Everything turns its back on it. It's sort of a, a no man's swath through the city that's not engaged. Um, so looking at it in section, looking at it in photographs, looking at the sort of uh, found objects along it that indicate sort of life that's happening there. Um, and these maps were really interesting to us because they often showed a very different um, reality than the data showed us, the sort of distant view um, that the other sources of information showed us. And then the, the very last thing that we asked them to do um, was actually to create a, an essay about their research. So to incorporate writing and to translate all of this visual research, which they have been doing throughout the course of the semester, we had asked them to write um, and sort of synthesize and analyze through the written form. But this last sort of project or essay was an opportunity for them to really think about it as a whole and what what did what did this whole series of maps sort of teach them not only about the history but more importantly about Raleigh's future and how it connects to um, to its history um, they were not necessarily making proposals about what to do about the rail system or the future of transportation in Raleigh, but they were asked to sort of think about how this whole, or, and reflect on how this whole effort uh, might sort of steer us in one direction over the other. And we published all of them, and we self-published all of them in uh, a book too called DIY Cartography. Um, so just as sort of a final reflective piece and a final analytic piece, uh, the student essay 
essays were a great way for them to really kind of make meaning out of everything that they had done throughout the course of the semester. And there are, um, actually, well, kind of, maybe we'll go to the next one, the last one. Um, and right now, actually, at the uh, City of Raleigh Museum, uh, we have an exhibit up through the end of February that has all of these maps, well, not every single one of them, but a large percentage of them um, hanging up and um, on display if you're interested in, uh, in visiting over there. Um, so it's up till Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday. And if you want to go back for one, yeah. So we had um, a ton of help with this class, especially um, neither one of us, especially me, are ARC map or GIS experts. And so Brendan Harmon, um, who's a PhD candidate in the College of Design, was incredibly instrumental and helpful in um, introducing the students in the class who had various levels. Of, some of them had never opened ArcMap before and others had sort of been introduced to it. So he was incredibly instrumental in sort of helping lead them through the process. Ernie Dollar over at the City of Raleigh Museum and Jeff, Jeff Essek, who's one of the organizers of this, um, was also very helpful in sort of uh, helping the students know where to access data through the library and other places. And our two TAs were awesome too. <laughs> so we planned for 20 minutes, so that's, that's what we got. So questions now or questions at the end? What would you prefer, Leah? Whatever you want. Doesn't matter. Are there any questions? <laughs> yeah, hey. Okay. Well. So you think you all can do self publishing the collection that? Yeah. It is. Yeah, yes. We'll, we'll get one for the library. Yes. Absolutely. We, yes. Um, it, you know, we, we self publish it on Blurb, which means that if you go to Blurb to buy it, it's like a gajillion dollars. Um, but we have some copies of it. Yes, yeah, so absolutely. Yes. Yes. It's on the, we have a website too, which we didn't put up there, but it's on the website as well. Yeah. 